Here at DJT, we get the same questions repetitively about what decisions electricians need to make for their qualifications moving into the future. We've taken time out today from teaching here at the Liver Buildings, and Andy Garrett, our lead tutor, is going to ask me some of those questions in the hope that it can help you make the right decisions moving forward with your careers. So Dave, these are some of the most common inquiries that we get both by phone and by email uh, that I think it, it would help if they were answered for people. Uh, when did the 2391 actually stop and the 2394 and 2395 come in? The, the 2391 actually stopped in 2012, although the City and Guilds allowed an extra exam to take place in 2013 for people that hadn't passed the written exam. So essentially, it was ended in 2012 and it was taken over by the 2394 and 2395 from 2013 onwards. And what's the actual difference between the 2394 and the 2395? Well, the 2391 that was used to cover all inspection and testing. The 2394 and 5 have broken it up into initial verification, which is the 2394, and periodic testing, which is the 2395. So, a delegate should take the 2394 to state that they can test an installation they've put in themselves and the 2395 which states that they can test other people's work when they're doing periodics or electrical installation condition reports. Okay, so in the event therefore that I've got a 2391, do I need to take a 2394 or a 2395? Well, that's a very, very commonly asked question. If your governing body state that you need to take the 94 and 95, if you were NAPIT approved or NIC approved or ECA approved, and they weren't happy with your competency level because you, you've had your 2391 for quite a while, they're well within their rights to ask you to get the 94 and 95. But essentially, if you've got the 2391, you have proven competency in inspection and testing. So I know depends isn't the right answer, but it does depend on your governing body. So what you're getting it's for. down to the governing body as to whether they recognise my 2391. Absolutely. Or they want me to do something else. That's right, yeah. I've got my 2395 but not my 2394. Okay. And my governing body saying I need both, and the JIB are saying they may not recognise. Well, the JIB, now you've brought the JIB into the frame, they've got a very structured criteria for what you're supposed to have in order to get an approved status or an electrician status. And they state categorically that you've got to have the 2394 and the 2395 for approved status. Your governing body, they want to they wanna make sure that you are competent in testing. So if you've only got the 2395, I would suggest the chances are they're going to let you run with that, but on their annual visit, at some point, again, the chances are they're going to say you're going to need to get the 2394 as well. And would that be the same then for a 2357? We have a candidate who took the 2357 all the way to level three, which included an inspection and testing element. Yep. And prior to making an inquiry, they were convinced that the GIB would accept that, but in fact, a similar things occur. Yeah, the JIB, again, it's a very set criteria. There is, a, I'm going to call it a misconception in the industry. I know that the city and guilds want the 2357 to encompass the 2394 initial verification, which is all well and good. But if you make your inquiries to the JIB without the 2394, there's a chance that they'll grade you down until you get it. Right. Okay. I'll tell you another phone inquiry we have. Okay. Because when the 2391 initially came out, they tried a couple of other new qualifications. The 2392 was one of them. Yeah, they did. Is that still recognised? Well, is it recognised? And what was it? Well, okay. When, when the 2392 came out, it was during the period of the 2391. So it was a qualification that was more related to Part P. If all you were going to do was domestic premises, you needed to have a testing qualification to say you could test your own work. The 2391 at the time was covering commercial and industrial environments. The 2392 didn't. With the advent of the 2394 and the 2395, the 2392 is very rarely mentioned. For example, if it was on your application for a JIB card, they wouldn't show any credence at all. If you showed it to the NAPIT or the NIC, they'd accept that you have that qualification, but again, the chances are they'd probably say to you, that's great, but now you need to get your 9495. Yeah. And in terms of the regs, we get inquiries about the regs as well. I yeah. mean, some people, for example, have, have uh, Got a 17th, but they've got it on the on the uh, initial red book. Yeah, that came out. Okay. Uh, what do they need to do really? Do they need to or, or date it at the moment? Or? Yeah. No. Okay. So we're going to talk in codes again. The 2382, which is the 17th edition, when that came out in 2008, in 2008 for the red book, it didn't have the same after number as this one's got. The yellow book is called the 2382 15. 
based on Amendment 3. If you've got the 17th edition, again, your governing body could say, that's fine, you've proven that you know how to reference BS 7671, that's good enough for us. But other governing bodies, and certainly employers, will ask the question, have you got it to Amendment 3? Because the Yellow Book have got so many changes, the ZSs have changed, the metal clamp boxes have changed, the 80% rules changed slightly on the ZSs. So a lot of employers want you to have the most current 17th edition. I suppose to answer the question, if you've got it, you've got it. You don't necessarily need to take it again. But be prepared for your NIC field officer or your NAPIC field officer to say, I know you've got your 17th edition, but we want you to get Amendment 3, the most modern version of it. Well, hopefully that's cleared up a lot of things around the 2394, 95, 2382. I'm going to muddy the water to you. Where does the AM2 fit into all this? Okay, the AM2 is something that's written by JTL, part of the JIB. So if you want to get a JIB card, the easiest way to get it would have been during your apprenticeship. You'd have done your level three, 2357 as it is now. In the old days, it was the 2330. In the even older days, it was the 2360. So you'd have done all those qualifications. And as part of your apprenticeship, you will have also done an AM2 and an MVQ. If you have all in, then you'll get graded as, as an electrician with the JIB. And then eventually you can get approved status once you get your inspection and testing qualifications. Without an AM2 or an MVQ level three, the JIB will not give you approved status. So you, I've known people in their 40s who've been in the industry for 25 years, and they have said, I made an application for a JIB card and it's come back as electrical improver or senior trainee because I haven't got an AM2. They're telling me I need to get an AM2. Now, whether I agree with that or disagree with it, that's where it fits into the model. I was going to say, outside of the JIB card, nobody's really that concerned yeah, about your AM2. Okay. The NIC card. And where does the ECS? It's better than the JIB card. We, we, as you know, electrical contractors fall into a lot of different categories. And if you're looking to go and work on big sites in London or Wembley Stadium or the airport conversion or whatever it might be, the main contractor will want you to have a JIB card. And that will have an ECS hologram on it to say that you've got your health and safety training. If you are part of a smaller company or self-employed or you own your own vehicle and you advertise in your local paper, then you'll join a governing body look for Part P. That could be the ECA, it could be NAPIT, it could be the NIC, Stroma is a new governing body for Part P. They're not going to talk about the AM2, they're not going to talk about MBQs. They'll look at your technical certs and they'll look at your 17th edition, 9495. If you've got them that you can prove your competence, they'll gladly take you on board. So in terms of this competency, if I am an electrician and I've been through an apprenticeship and subsequently got a 2394 or a 2395, maybe both, can I class myself as competent? Am I classed as competent? Oh, absolutely. The, the classification of competence, again, it's interesting because we're talking about the 17th edition where competent person's been taken out of it under the yellow book. So, but in electricity at work ranks, it's still there. The description of competent person still exists. To prove competency, not to quote it word for word, but you must demonstrate skills and knowledge. And the knowledge element is qualifications. If you've got a tech cert, a 17th edition, and the two testing quals, it would be very difficult to say that you weren't competent. And would I be able to get a GIB card with that? With the tech, with a tech cert, a 17th edition, a 9.4 and a 9.5, you get a card. Whether you get approved status or not is a different matter because they're going to want you to get the AM2 and possibly an MVQ. So the JIB and the governing bodies are both looking at things in slightly different ways. Absolutely they are, yeah. Um, talking about the JIB, it's interesting. If you want to get onto a site with a JIB card, it's quite easy to get an electrician's card. The holy grail seems to be approved electrician, which is where you need your MVQ and your AM2. Right. But to get an electrician's card, you could get graded as an electrician quite easily without having the others in place, the AM2 and the MVQ and that will get you on site, albeit on a slightly lower rate of pay. And then later on, you could take your MVQ, because the 2357, you can do the MVQ independently, but you have to do a multiple choice exam on sustainable energy to get through. Okay, well, thanks very much, Dave. I think you've really up, Cheers, then.